Jesus said in Matthew 28 verse 19, Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Welcome to Go Teach All Nations, bringing you Christ's teachings through Australian and international speakers. Today's message was presented at the GYC 2012 conference in Seattle, Washington. For other sources like this, visit gycweb.org. Today's topic, Discovering the Power, by John Bradshaw. Well now, let's begin. Uh, We talked yesterday about the concept of yielding. Today, unleashing the power. Where is the power? Where is the power? Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that we can be here today. We are grateful for your spirit. We're grateful for your presence. We are grateful for the Bible. Thank you for the word of God. And Lord, as we discuss today, I pray that you, would, that you would set a fire burning in us that would blaze brightly, not just now, but forever. We want to be an integral part of serving you. We want to be in the thick of things. We want to be available to you. And so bless us, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I would tell you, as we told you yesterday, uh, yesterday and today, at least these two morning s- sessions, I'm talking a little more big picture and conceptual. What you really want to hear is Pastor Jim Howard when he starts to talk about the nuts and bolts and the tools and the things that you can put in your toolkit and your work belt and in your armory. Um, What he's going to be sharing is absolutely vital, and I would appeal to you not to miss it. There are many other things. I've got to tell you this. There are many other seminars here that are worth hearing, but none of them will be as useful to you in a practical, soul-winning sense, as what you hear Pastor Jim Howard talk about in parts four, five, and six of this seminar. So whatever you do, you just don't want to miss it. He's going to be talking to you about the tools you can use, how to turn your, uh, your church congregation into a soul-winning center, uh, how, how, you can, how you can not just talk about plans, but make them happen. And uh, he, he talked about that a little bit yesterday, but what he's going to be discussing is, is absolutely vital. And so recently, it was a year or so ago, a 29-year-old man from New Jersey decided that he would attend a wilderness survival training course that was held in the state of Utah in the month of July. And I'll tell you the name of the company that ran it, but that might be a little bit unfair under the circumstances. You see, you get these guys who never played rugby in their life, and now they need to prove to themselves that they're men. Some of us, we, you know, we, we got that figured out long ago. But this guy was 29 years old. I think he had an office job. And, uh, you know, you can, you can just die on the vine. And, and he said to himself, no, I've got to go and, and push myself to the limits and get out there in the outdoors and defeat it and not be defeated by it. And so he and a number of others went to the school in uh, Utah. The people who ran the program, it was their intention to push people to the limit. And they did. And they said to them, no food today, no water today, other than what you can find out there in the desert. I don't know if you've been in too many deserts in Utah in July, but there's not typically a whole lot of water out there. Temperatures that day got up above 100 degrees. People out there got thirsty. And you know what happens after you're thirsty. You can start to dry out, and he became dehydrated. Now, when he was hallucinating and slurring his speech... The people around him said, these are classic symptoms of real dehydration. And he didn't just get dehydrated, he got dehydrated. Uh, Later in the day, this man fell face down into the dirt, dirt, uh, in the Utah desert, and he died. Emergency personnel had to hike for four or five or six hours just to get his body and haul it out of there. He had no water. And unsurprisingly, given the circumstances, he perished out there in the Utah desert. He had no water. As tragic as that is, here's what makes it even more tragic. This man died 100 feet from a pool of water. 100 feet. And what's even worse is that the people who who were conducting this course and leading out in this course, the course, what are you called, leaders, I guess you'd call them, had water on them, literally on them, inside coat pockets and on belts and so forth. They had water bottles. Other people, when they were tending to this dead man, were amazed that they could hear water sloshing around. Our friend perished 
while people around him were carrying water which could have saved his life, which would have saved his life. Totally unnecessary, extraordinarily sad, completely needless, but no different to what happens in our churches on a daily basis. People are dying when the life-giving Holy Spirit is being offered to them on a moment-by-moment basis. There is no reason that our churches ought to be deserts for and of the Holy Spirit. No reason at all. We should be wading through uh, deep rivers of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God ought to be falling down around us and on us. Listen to these words. If you have a Bible, you might as well open it up. Luke 4, not Luke, John, <laughs> Luke 4, John 14. And we'll look in verse 16. <clears throat> if you have an iPad or a phone or something, I guess you could open that up too. John 14, verse 16, Jesus said, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. This is in verse 18. I will come to you. Jesus promised us the Holy Spirit. And I'm not interested in trying to define just what the Holy Spirit is because it's, it's an impossible task. We will find out when you get to heaven. Other than the Holy Spirit brings to us the personal presence of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is the third member of the Godhead. Uh, for anybody to die of thirst spiritually when Jesus has promised to send us the Holy Spirit is a calamity. Now, just let me appeal to you. <clears throat> I'm, I'm, I'm stepping out of my track here a little bit. Here's what Christians have taught for hundreds and hundreds of years, and that is that the Holy Spirit is a person and is a member of the Godhead. That's what Seventh-day Adventists believe. Now, I don't care for you to go back to 1845 and say that one of our pioneers was confused on the subject, but because Ellen White said the pioneers had the truth, then we ought to be confused on the subject as well. Ladies and gentlemen, I beg you, if you're going to be any use to God at all, and any use to God's work at all, don't get caught up in what I would term theologically dumb stuff. Just don't do it. Just don't do it. It's as plain as the nose on your face that the Holy Spirit has personality. We are told again and again and again in the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy, the Holy Spirit is a person. We are told again and again and again, it's as clear as clear that the, that the Holy Spirit is a member of the Godhead. Now, it could be, it could be that we wake up one day and we discover that the entire Seventh Adventist Church for 150 years has just been wrong about one of the biggest points of doctrine that we have. <clears throat> but I don't think so. I don't think so. Friend, there are deceptions around every corner, and there's one with your name written on it. And unless you purpose in your heart that you're going to stand on the Bible and the spirit of prophecy, unless you purpose in your heart that you are not going to decide you know more than the church knows, then one of those deceptions is going to eat you up and swallow you down. Don't get dragged off into into anti-Trinitarianism and the Holy Spirit isn't a person. And I'm not just going to keep the Sabbath. I'm going to keep the lunar Sabbath. And this week it's Saturday. Next week it's Wednesday. And the week after that it's Friday. There's a reason lunar and lunacy sound similar. (laughs) Stay on track. Stay on the ship. Stay with the Bible. Because what happens is you get drawn this way and you get drawn that way and not only does it drag you into hell, but you're going to drag somebody else with you and your witness and your soul winning capacity and your evangelistic output will not only go to zero, it'll go to negative terms. You'll be a blight on the work of God and a hindrance to the church. So stay straight. Keep it in the word of God and don't get dragged away. 
You see, Jesus knew that we might be drowning men and women one day. He offered to throw us a life preserver. That would be the Holy Spirit. He knew that we were going to have a difficult time down here in the end of time. He knew that there would be temptations and there'd be sin and there'd be, there'd be pools of quicksand just about everywhere we walked as, as human beings and especially as Christians, you understand. And then he realized that, that he was going to give us a weighty commission. He's going to say to us, go and finish the work. Now, now you don't think that he's going to say that to us without equipping us for actually finishing the work. When Jesus left this world, he left, in fact, he didn't leave 12, he left 11. Because one of them went and hung himself uh, shortly before Jesus died. And if you look at those 11, they were a bunch of misfits. And Jesus said, now I'm going to go to heaven now and leave the church with you. That would be, I mean, how do you think Jesus felt about that? I, I, I wonder sometimes if he didn't realize that he was taking a huge risk, except that he knew the character of those people, and he knew that he was not going to leave them comfortless. He would send the Holy Spirit to them, and the Holy Spirit would make the difference. Here's what we need to understand. The gift of the Holy Spirit isn't an extra that you take on board in your experience. The gift of the Holy Spirit isn't a bonus that good Christians get when you reach a certain level. The Holy Spirit is an essential, an absolutely vital cannot let go of it, not optional, part of our Christian experience. In fact, the Holy Spirit, if you allow me to say so, is our Christian experience. For without the Holy Spirit, we aren't Christians and we have nothing. The Holy Spirit is first grade Christianity, not post-doctoral Christianity. I, I want you to consider what God does through the power of the Holy Spirit. It keeps something in mind as we talk about finishing the work, and that's this. The person who wants to see the work of God finished more than anybody else is God. God's not, God's not saying, well, I've got to keep them waiting because we haven't had our quota of tsunamis yet. We've got to send some more. God is not saying there hadn't been enough earthquakes or school shootings. Let's just hold off a while longer. God wants this work finished. If you've read anything at all, then you know that it had been written, the Lord may have returned ere this. The work could have been done long ago. God wants to see the work finished more than anybody. God wants you to be in heaven more than you want to be in heaven. Uh, this is something that God longs for, and therefore he has promised to provide the power for this. You are not going to ask a person to get the job done and then see to it that they are ill-equipped to get the job done. You're not going to ask your kid to go and mow the lawn and give him a pair of scissors and say, here, good luck with that. This would be madness. And God's not going to say to us, I want the work finished. Now you go figure it out. I love it when I read these very helpful things in church publications that say, you know, the, uh, the average age of Seventh-day Adventists is getting older. The average age in the world is, I don't know what, 35, but in the church it's 95 or something like that. <laughs> I'm not worried about that. I don't care what the average age of church members is. Now, if the point is we're not winning enough young people, I care about that. Oh, we're winning them this fast, but we're losing them that f Listen, I'm not saying that those things are of no consequence or that, we, or that we don't have to worry about them or sweat them at all, but God is able to overcome all that. All that. You remember that story back in 2 Kings? city of Samaria had been surrounded. Everybody on the inside was starving to death. The only people on the outside were Syrian soldiers and four lepers. And the lepers were starving too. And they, were, they said, well, let's just try our luck. If the Syrians kill us, we're going to die anyway. But let's go out there and see if they'll save us alive. And so out they went like lambs to the slaughter. And by the time they got there, God had worked miraculously to drive off the Syrians. Not a shot was fired. They got out there and they ate and drank and they changed their clothes and they went and hid stuff. They said, oh, all our Christmases have come at once. And then they said, wait a minute. We do not well. There's a sermon there. We do not well. This is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we wait until the morning light, some mischief's going to come upon us. So therefore, let us come and go and tell the king's household. Four lepers. These were the scum of society, the off-scouring of society. They were unclean. They couldn't even freely associate with anybody. And they went 
to the city, and who's going to listen to a leper? So they sent some messengers out. Then there was a stampede, and, and the famine was all over in a day. God saved a city using four lepers. Friend, we need to understand something. If God can save a city using four lepers, then he can save a city using some of us. He can do something great. He could save a community, a family, not because of us, but through us and using us. All God needs is somebody to be willing, and then he'll add the power. <clears throat> I live in Southern California, and I, I'm not bragging except just to say it's about 60 degrees there right now. That's kind of nice. Um, I wasn't raised in Southern California, and I'm not taking responsibility for it. But it's brown. You, you love it if you like brown. Where I live, it's brown. It's, it, it looks a lot like that wall there, except not nearly as pretty. It's brown, arid, and then a funny thing happens. It'll rain once a year for several days, and then you look outside, and it's green. You say, where did that come from? No, it's, right now it's green. It looks like Wisconsin. Okay, it's not that green, but it's, it's, it still looks shabby, but it's green. It's a pretty sort of a shabby. <laughs> I put it another way. My son decided that he was going to plant some stuff outside our kitchen window on a little hillside. And he planted some radishes and, and watermelons and pumpkins and various things. And, uh, and they didn't really come to anything. Until recently... Uh, recently, the, the, the landlady put in some irrigation, and that little hillside started getting lots of water. Every day, there were lots of water. And, and this was like in late November, my son is out there harvesting radishes. All you needed to do was add water. That's all. It looks brown there and barren there, but when the rain comes, it's, it's transformed. It, it, all you've got to do is add water. We might look arid and barren and, and, and not up to much. All God needs to do is add water. That's all. The showers of the Holy Spirit. And when the Spirit of God is added, something remarkable takes place. There is power to get the job done. In the Desire of Ages, page 669, the Holy Spirit is described as the most essential and complete gift that God could bestow upon His followers a gift that would bring within their reach the boundless resources of grace. Now, let's consider some of what we read in the Bible about the Holy Spirit in connection with getting the work of God done. Turn with me to Acts chapter 1, and we'll read a few verses here. Acts 1, I'll start reading in verse 4 while you turn, or while you log on, or whatever you do these days. Acts 1 verse 4, being assembled together with them, commanded, that is, uh, I'll just read, commanded that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but, and this is Jesus speaking, wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Now they were all confused. They said, are you going to at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus said, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put into his own power. Verse 8, but you shall receive what? Power. Power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Jesus had said, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but wait in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. And what happened here? Let's see what happened. We go to Acts chapter 2, and we'll start in verse 1. Acts 2 and verse 1. And I find it interesting that this book is called the Acts of who? The Apostles. The book I really think ought to be called the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Because everything that happened that was worth anything at all in the book of Acts was done due to the work of the Holy Spirit. It was as simple as that. The Spirit of God did everything in the book of Acts, especially in the area of soul winning and evangelism. Keep in mind, there is a direct parallel. Those disciples had a work to get done. It was, it was, it was their goal to take the gospel to the world. It was, in their minds, they were going to finish the work. 
You understand what I mean? They're in a very similar situation as we are now. Very similar. Different era, but very similar situation. So what they went through and what we are faced with are, are, are really parallels, I think. Acts chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And there's a message for us there, isn't there, brother? All with one accord in one place. We, we could get sidetracked here, and it would sound a little bit like what uh, Adam said during the, the, the worship hour yesterday. When we learn to put all our stuff aside and get swallowed up in one great aim, that is of living for and sharing Jesus, then we'll really see God do something. But let's read on. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So firstly, we see the Spirit of God descend upon them. Then something miraculous takes place. They're unable to restrain themselves, and they begin sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. They do so in a variety of languages. Second, when the people see what, what's taking place, they are, they, are, they are shaken by this. Their response is, first of all, what's going on here? Are these men drunk? Peter gets up and he preaches. The Holy Spirit drives him into action. It's not possible that Peter can sit still and keep quiet. He proclaims the Word of God. The people, as a result, are convicted and they ask the big question, Men and brethren, what shall we do? They are told what they need to do, and they do it, and 3,000 people are baptized. And how did that happen? Not because Peter was astute, not because he was brilliant, not because he was well-trained, even though he was well-trained, not because of those things, but it happened because Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit of God. The power of God descended upon him. Friend, here's what you need, the power of God. It's that simple. Now, again, and, and, and you're going to understand here that I'm not, I'm not against training. I mean, it is written, operates at evangelism training school, SALT, at Southern Adventist University. We believe in this thing. But even if you got no training and you got the Holy Spirit of God, God could do something with you. Now, if you got the Holy Spirit of God and training, God could do much more with you. There's no question. But the component we all must have is the Holy Spirit of Almighty God. Think about what took place at Pentecost. I read this in the book, Acts of the Apostles, not this Acts of the Apostles, but what Ellen White wrote, Acts of the Apostles. Let me read this. The glad tidings of, the, of a risen Savior were carried to the uttermost parts of the inhabited world. This is what took place at, at and because of Pentecost. The glad tidings of a risen Savior were carried to the uttermost part of the inhabited world. That's, that's significant right there. As the disciples proclaimed the message of redeeming grace, hearts yielded to the power of the message. I hold evangelistic meetings with, with great frequency. And here's what I know. It doesn't matter how eloquent I am or how well I choose my words or how clever I am in the pulpit. What matters is whether the Holy Spirit is working and hearts are yielding to the grace of God. I recall holding a meeting in one little old town. It was a town where, where nothing much happens in terms of public evangelism. And we went there, and I was as green as green and hardly knew what I was doing. And I was encouraging the church members to sit in the, in the uh, meeting hall in the church, meeting hall and then church, and pray. And there was one dear lady who was, who was, a, who was a, whew, I've got to run through my... Uh, my uh, thesaurus of, of uh, what do you call a word when you're substituting another word and you're trying to use it? Synonyms. I'm going to find a, you sure it's a synonym? I've got to find a synonym. She was a, um, she was, she was a sweet lady. <laughs> she was a sweet lady. That's a, no, that's a, that's a synonym. She was a sweet lady. And, uh, you know, she was one of these ladies who say, oh, she's nice, but she means well. You know, one of them ladies, she meant well. She said, I'm not going to sit in the, in the meeting hall. I'm going to go off to a little side room and just pray. 
I said, well, you could pray in the meeting hall because then you'd see people, you could pray for that. No, no, I just want to pray. And I'm going to give this whole, t- I'm, not g- I'm going to be the whole time you're speaking in a little room praying. I was happy for that. That's fine. I just didn't think she needed to go lock herself in a room, but that's up to her. We saw God do in that evangelistic series things that you wouldn't expect God would do. We saw hearts yield that you would never expect would yield. You know, I, I, I knew it wasn't because of me. I knew very quickly it was because of this sweet lady who was in a room praying her heart out pleading with God. I'm talking about the judgment. She's praying that God would win her heart. I'm talking about the Sabbath. She's praying that God would bring people to conviction. I'm talking about baptism. She's praying that people will make decisions and give their lives to Jesus. It's work of the Holy Spirit. Hearts yielded to the power of the message. The church beheld converts flocking to her from all directions. Isn't that what you'd like to see? You'd like to see that. It happened at Pentecost. Why? Because the Holy Spirit fell. The Holy Spirit fell. Backsliders were reconverted. Sinners united with believers in seeking the pearl of great price. This is all that Ellen White said. Uh, or, or, these are all things she said about what happened at Pentecost and beyond. Some who had been the bitterest opponents of the gospel became its champions. Wouldn't you like to see that? Every Christian saw in his brother a revelation of divine love and benevolence. You need to think about that. One interest prevailed. The ambition of the believers was to reveal the likeness of Christ's character and to labor for the enlargement of his kingdom. Let's be honest. We do not have that in the Seventh-day Adventist church now, generally speaking. There's a reason God refers to us as Laodicea. We have lost sight of of why God has called us into existence. And I mean generally speaking, generally. It may be an unfair characterization, but I don't think it's unfair. The ambition of the believers, all the believers, was to reveal the likeness of Christ's character and to labor for the enlargement of his kingdom. This is what happened when God did then what he wants to do now, and his people then didn't resist. So mightily can God work when people give themselves up to the control of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you something you know, but if you leave here today really knowing it and never forgetting it, then mission accomplished. God has called us to get a work done. It won't get done by might or by power, but it will get done by my Spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. So what happened? You had Acts chapter 2, Pentecost, and thousands were baptized, and it was remarkable. So let's keep going through the book of the Acts of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 3, Peter and John went to pray. They saw a lame man on the way. Remember that story? And the man said, will you give, us, give me some money? And, and, and they said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he went walking and leaping and doing what? And do you know, if you read this story, this miracle opened the way for a more powerful moving of the Holy Spirit of God. The crippled man was healed. This was, of course, you could call this medical missionary work. But this was, this was, this was medical missionary work that's been kicked up a notch. You understand what I'm saying? This was something absolutely supernatural done by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God healed this man, opening the way for a great working of God. Acts chapter 4, verse 8. Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said to them, you rulers of the people and elders of Israel. As a matter of fact, let me back up a little bit. As they spoke to the people, the priests and certain of the temple and uh, and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold the next day because it was now even. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. You see what's happening here? Massive growth, massive growth. Another 5,000 believed. Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost in verse 8, starts to preach The Holy Spirit starts working. He's speaking with great boldness, and people are being shaken, shaken. 
Uh, in Acts chapter 5, you have the situation with Ananias and Sapphira. You can, you can dig deeper into this, of course. Ananias and Sapphira. And, and you know, was, I'm sorry those folks lost their lives, but what happened as a result of them losing their lives was that people stepped back and said, wow, God is really with us. Fear of a, of a certain holy kind descended upon the believers there. And the work was advanced and not retarded because of what happened through Ananias and Sapphira. And what happened through there, through them, in them, was the working of the Holy Spirit. Hey, hang on a minute. You've lied to the Holy Spirit. What was going on there? Spirit of God was at work. Movement was being advanced. Acts chapter 6. You read that early in the chapter, they select deacons. And I notice that it says in verse 5 that Stephen was a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. In verse 3, find seven men of honest report full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. The Spirit of God couldn't be disconnected from the work of God back there in the times of the early Christian church. Just couldn't be. Someone said this. I'll just about remember where I heard this. You might have even heard it said where I heard it said. Someone wrote in a book, and it was quoted by one of our guys. In the early Christian church, if the Holy Spirit had been removed, 90% of what was going on would have come to a stop. It might even have been more. If the Holy Spirit was removed from the Seventh-day Adventist church, today, this person said, not me, I wouldn't say such a thing, but this person said, 90% of what's going on today would probably just keep on going on. I didn't say that. I'm just telling you somebody else said. (laughs) Acts chapter 7, Stephen is preaching, and you read in verse 55 that he was full of the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 8, believers receive the Spirit. Then the Holy... Philip is so in tune with God that when the Holy Spirit says, I want you to go and talk to that guy in the chariot, he goes. Spirit of God led him out into the wilderness. Get in the chariot. He ends up baptizing the man. Then Philip left because the Holy Spirit caught him away. Wouldn't it be something if you were able to say, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to Aberdeen, Washington, Because the Spirit of God is driving me there. I know where I'm going to go to school. I'm going to go to Penn State or UT or or Andrews University for one reason, and that's because the Holy Spirit is compelling me to go there. The believers back in the time of the early Christian church had a supernatural experience. And I don't want to encourage you to start start living in a supernatural like you are some kind of uh, space cadet. You don't want to do that. But if we are close to God, God is going to lead us to people. The Lord is going to tell us, this one. God will say, don't say that, say this instead. God will tell you what door to knock on. If we're as close to the Lord as Stephen was. Acts chapter 8, we did that. Acts chapter 9, Saul has been fighting against the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Then he's filled with the Holy Ghost. He begins to preach. Those who hear him are amazed. The churches are multiplied because, and I quote, they were walking in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. Peter heals Aeneas. Peter raises Dorcas or Tabitha from the dead. I mean, what was going on there was fantastic. And I don't know that we must raise the dead today. That's up to God. If he wants the dead raised and you're close to God and he wants you to do it, then you'll raise the dead. You don't want to run ahead of God. Oh, I don't want to tell this story because it happened in New Zealand, my home country, but I will. Just recently, a young guy started going to church and it was one of these Holy Spirit churches where people were healed and all kinds of things happened. He decided that he was going to go to a funeral and raise a dead man. Man was 90 years old and very dead. Then he walked into the funeral and placed his hand on the casket and started slapping it. Wake up, wake up. God tells you to wake up. His pastor was there with him, didn't realize the young man was going to do this. They get him out. They try to straighten him up, then he goes back to the graveyard and tries to raise the man from the dead. You don't want to do that. 
but you do want to do what God asks you to do. I don't want to make you afraid now, but you do want to do what God asks you to do. And if you're close to God, you're not going to hear mixed messages and confused signals. You're not. I want you to notice what was going on there. We talk about this like it's all in a day's work. But the Holy Spirit fell. They were speaking languages they had not studied. To me, that's a big deal. Uh, we have an evangelistic series coming up in, oh, well, we have, we have uh, southern Mexico uh, next month in January, uh, Costa Rica in February, and I don't speak Spanish at all uh, beyond just a few words, unas palabras. And then, in, uh, and then in March, we got a meeting in the Czech Republic. My Spanish isn't good, but it's a whole lot better than my Czech. <laughs> Czech is tough, man. There's hardly any. You, you know, with Spanish, you hear them say sabado. Well, you know what that is. That sounds like Sabbath, you know. But in Czech, there's nothing that sounds like English. It's, a, it's different. If, if, if I stood up before people and spoke Czech, That would be a miracle of grand proportions. What was taking place at Pentecost was a miracle of grand proportions. And then they healed a lame man. I have never seen a lame man healed. To me, this would just be fantastic. I know it happens. One of when our editors written team was in India a few years ago. There was a boy and he was he was blind or he was crippled or he was something. And they prayed for that boy, and he recovered just right there before their eyes. Things happen. But that's a miracle of immense proportions. And then Peter raises this woman from the dead. I mean, this is big stuff. Acts chapter 10, Peter has the vision of the unclean animals. And then he is told by God, go and preach and not consider the Gentiles to be unclean. Go on down there to Cornelius' house. This is the work of the Holy Spirit. You just cannot escape the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts. It wasn't a one-hit wonder. Everywhere I turn around, I'm seeing advertisements for five-hour energy. You drink this, and you're going to be able to do whatever you want to do. Well, you know, I would advise you not to do that. Just get some sleep and eat some oranges and kiwi fruit or something. You'll be okay. When God promises the Holy Spirit, he's not talking about a false boost that you get from a a caffeine blast out of a little bottle. This is not Red Bull. This is the real deal. The whole, you can be plugged in and glowing because the Spirit of God has come upon you. The Holy Spirit, I'm quoting now from Acts of the Apostles, page 38. The Holy Spirit came upon the waiting, praying disciples with a fullness that reached every heart. The infinite one revealed himself in power to his church. It was as if for ages this influence had been held in restraint. Sounds familiar. And now heaven rejoiced in being able to pour out upon the churches the riches of the Spirit's grace. And under the influence of the Spirit, words of penitence and confession mingled with songs of praise for sins forgiven. Words of thanksgiving and prophecy were heard. All heaven bent low to behold and to adore the wisdom of matchless, incomprehensible love. Lost in wonder, the apostles exclaimed, herein is loved, love. They grasped the imparted gift. And what followed? I love this language. The sword of the Spirit, newly edged with power and bathed in the lightnings of heaven, cut its way through unbelief. Thousands were converted in a day. Now, if you have not received any form of formal training in terms of soul winning and evangelism, Get it. You ought to. If you can't go to Salt or you can't go to some other school, go to the pastor of your church and say, hey, get something figured out. Send me somewhere, bring someone here, or you teach me or tell me what reason. You need to get training. No question about it. But there are plenty of people who have, who have received training who are as useless as bumps on a log because they have not received the Holy Spirit. You understand what I'm saying? These two things have got to go hand in hand. These disciples here, they've been with Jesus for three and a half years now. It's not like they learned nothing. But then the Spirit of God fell, and something great happened. If you are in a warfare, and you are, you need to have the best weapons you can get your hands on, the very best. That's why the military, our military spends gobs of money on 
technologically advanced weaponry, because you don't want the other guy to have the edge, and you are in a battle against a fearsome foe. When you're going after someone in terms of soul winning, there's someone else going after that person as well. And the forces of darkness are powerful. I read about some of the things that Uncle Sam has. These F-14 airplanes, Tomcats they call them, they fly almost 1,500 miles an hour. F-15s, 1,875 miles an hour. We were at a museum in, in Dayton, Ohio. It's a magnificent museum, the National Air Force Museum. It's phenomenal. There are B-52 strato fortresses there. Humongous planes. They carry 70,000 pounds of ordnance. These B-2 stealth bombers. And they're really something. They can fly 6,000 miles without refueling. They've got the skin on them and they're shaped in such a way that the enemy can, can almost not detect them at all. They retired the Blackbird, the SR-71. It used to fly at Mark III. I don't know how fast that is, other than it's really, really, really fast. These are real weapons. I read about this thing. Tsar, Tsar, like a Russian Tsar. Tsar Bomba. Tsar Bomba. That's one of those Slavic words that sound a whole lot like an English word. Bomba. You know what I'm talking about there. This was this translated emperor bomb. Hydrogen bomb, the most powerful nuclear weapon ever detonated. They tested it over, over 50 years ago. Yeah, over 50 years ago. Soviet Union developed it. Its, ori- its original intent was that this, this, this weapon would have a yield of about 100 megatons of TNT. Now, you might not know how big that is, but I'll tell you in a minute. They had to reduce the yield by half because a bomb that size would have blown the aircraft that dropped it out of the air. It's just huge. The nuclear fallout would have been too great. They only built one of them and tested one of them. How big was this bomb? Think of Little Boy and Fat Man. Those were the bombs that dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Think of those bombs. Combined. This one, Tsar Bomba, was 1,400 times more powerful than those two bombs combined. When they tested this thing, it, 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 it had a... Had a uh, it destroyed an area larger than the city of Paris. It was way up in, way up in the wilds of Russia. There's not much there anyway, I suppose. They didn't mind destroying some of that. Wilderness. Huge, huge. The fireball was two miles across. This thing was huge. Turn with me to Acts, uh, Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul writes, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. I'll drop down to verse, well, I won't actually. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. You ought to let those words sink in. We are really involved in a real warfare. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. He says, have your loins girt about with truth. Have on the breastplate of righteousness. Your feet ought to be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation. I want you to notice something about these weapons so far. If you think about a, a belt or a breastplate or shoes of some kind and a shield and a helmet, these are defensive weapons. Nobody ever walked into battle sharpening their shield 
and saying, I'm going to take out as much of the enemy as I can with my shield. These are defensive weapons, but there's an offensive weapon listed here, which is next. And take in verse 17, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. I want you to notice that the Word of God is described as the sword of the Spirit which means you wield it, but it's the Spirit that makes it effective. The Word of God isn't the sword of you. It isn't the sword of a preacher or the sword of the church. It's the sword of the Spirit. You might act, but God, through the Holy Spirit, is going to do something powerful because the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. A friend of mine once said something very interesting, I, I thought. He said, he said, the Word of God is like a lion. You don't need to defend it. You just need to let it loose, and it'll defend itself. God has given us a powerful tool, the sword of the Spirit. Listen to this from Acts of the Apostles. The arguments of the apostles alone, though clear and convincing, would not have removed the prejudice that had withstood so much evidence. But the Holy Spirit sent the arguments home to the hearts with divine power. The words of the apostles were as sharp arrows of the Almighty, convicting men of their terrible guilt and rejecting and crucifying the Lord of glory. You see, when the Spirit of God is poured out, you don't use the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit uses you. If we can learn to share Jesus in a way that relies on the power of the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit, we'll see greater results. I said something recently that is not original. Um, and, And you may well have heard this before, but nobody was ever converted because they lost the argument. Very few people become Seventh day Adventists. Because they say, you know, you argued so well and defeated me so thoroughly, I've got no other thing to do than join your church. (laughs) But when the Holy Spirit works, the old story is told about uh, some fellow who came to town. He challenged the pastor of the church to a debate. They were going to debate about baptism. I'll tell us quickly because time is, is pressing. And the, the, the pastor ended up with laryngitis and couldn't, couldn't do the job. And he turned to the old deacon and said to the deacon, you need to do this. And the deacon was as meek as anything. And so the deacon uh, went, went to the debate and, and he was going to talk first. The other guy would talk second and he would have the right of reply. And he, he opened up his Bible to a certain verse, read the verse and sat down. His opponent was convinced he had him beaten. He stood up and spoke for an hour. The old guy stood up again, flattened out his page, looked at the verse, and said, it's still there. Closed his Bible and sat down. All we are are vessels through whom the Holy Spirit can work. That's all. When you, you know, I, I've, been in, I've been in more fights in my time than I care to admit. And uh, some of them you wouldn't call fair. Every time you walk into a situation, a spiritual situation, and you are armed with the Holy Spirit of God, it's not a fair fight. It doesn't matter whether you are up against a theologian, an atheist, a skeptic, Ours is simply to be there and be available so that the Holy Spirit can use us on some level. And when the Spirit of God takes occasion to work through you, something powerful will occur. So, our homework assignment is this. As to get on our knees and plead with God that He would give us His Holy Spirit. Every day. Every day. If you did not pray this morning that God would give you His Holy Spirit in a powerful way, then you were neglectful. 
Now, you might pray that and your day's just going to go on by and you don't see any discernible difference. But you will pray that God will give you the Holy Spirit of God and then opportunities to, 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 to be used in His service. And when the two come together, it's going to be like a nuclear explosion. We plead with, we tell Him, Lord, I yield to you. Count me in. I want to be involved in this. Don't want to sit on the sidelines. And then, Lord, now that I'm in, fill me with your Holy Spirit so something can happen. And God has promised us, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask Him? If Bill Gates walked in and said, I will give a million dollars to everybody in this room, you'd be all over it. And so would I. But God has promised us a gift far greater and far more valuable to everybody. No strings attached. He will give you the Holy Spirit of God. This is something that will get the work done. The work will not be finished without a powerful outpouring of the Spirit of God. And it will fall. The Spirit will fall, but not necessarily on you if you are not appealing to God, praying that He will fill you up. Let me read this. If the fulfillment of the promise is not seen as it might be, it is because the promise is not appreciated as it should be. If all were willing, all would be filled with the Spirit. Not if all were intelligent, if all were brilliant, if all were capable, but if all were willing. Simple as that. Wherever the need of the Holy Spirit is a matter little thought of, there is seen spiritual drought, spiritual darkness, spiritual declension, and death. Whenever minor matters occupy the attention, the divine power which is necessary for the growth and prosperity of the church, and which would bring all other blessings in its train, is lacking, though offered in infinite plenitude. God has promised that your life need never be the same again. If you just say, here I am, Lord, like a dry ground, rain on me, God will do it. Not just not like that cat who tried to buy the Holy Spirit and use the Spirit for your glory, His glory. Lord, pour your Spirit down on me because I want to be used for your glory. God will do something remarkable. It's 1047. Let's pray. Our Father, bless us with your Spirit. I, I appeal to you that you would, you, would, you would turn all of us into people who would do at bare minimum nothing less then plead with you to be filled with your Spirit. Nothing's going to happen if we are not filled up. And yet you have given us example after example, story after story, account after account of people who were filled with your Spirit, how you poured your Spirit out in great measure. Lord, we know that the latter rain is going to fall. No question. The only question is, will it fall on us? We are asking you today to allow your spirit to fall on us, that you would be glorified in us. Now, you will either do that or you are a liar because you have promised that you are more willing to give your Holy Spirit to your children than parents are to give good gifts to theirs. So Father, allow us to work in harmony with you, to yield to you, to, to, to surrender, and then fill us up to overflowing for your glory and honor, we pray. Thanking you in Jesus' name. Would you say with me, amen. This message was recorded by Fountain View Productions for GYC. GYC, a supporting ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, seeks to inspire and equip young people to be vibrant, Bible-based, and Christ-centered Christians. To download or purchase other resources, visit gycweb.org. This program has been brought to you by 3ABN Australia Radio.